Welcome to Intangibles, a podcast about traits, behaviors, and qualities that entrepreneurs can cultivate to help be successful. I'm your host, Steve Berg. I'm a partner at a New York City-based venture capital fund called Lytical Ventures. Lytical Ventures focuses on early stage investments of companies that drive corporate intelligence. Corporate intelligence includes, for example, cybersecurity, data and analytics, and artificial intelligence. You can find us at www.liticalventures.com. Lytical is spelled L-Y-T-I-C-A-L. Ventures, all one word, dot com. This season is brought to you by Denton's Venture Technology Group at dentonsventurebeyond.com. Operating as a boutique within the world's largest law firm, the Venture Technology Group runs with hard-charging tech entrepreneurs to drive growth through strategic business, finance, and legal advice from Silicon Valley and New York to London, Berlin, Hong Kong, and beyond. Learn more at dentonsventurebeyond.com. We have a new production partner this season, VC Careers. If you're looking for a job in venture capital, join over 8,000 VCs and VC job hunters on John Gannon's VC Jobs email list. Visit johngannonblog.com slash intangibles to learn more and to subscribe. Also, please find Intangibles on its new home on the web, www.intangiblespodcast, all one word, dot com. President Jimmy Carter once said, I'll never tell a lie. I'll never make a misleading statement. I'll never betray the confidence that any of you had in me. Conversely, British billionaire Alan Sugar is quoted as saying, nobody can honestly say that they never lie. This is a conundrum. Let's say Sugar is right. In this case, do I go about my day as a cynic, sure that everyone is out to take advantage of me? Or let's say Sugar is wrong and there is such a thing as an honest person. Do I then go about my day withholding the benefit of the doubt from honest people, or perhaps worse, walking around a sucker open to be taken advantage of by a basket of deplorables? It would sure be great if I could spot lies in the lying liars who tell them. According to statistics, most of us think we know a charlatan when we see one, but in fact we don't. And as I had mentioned, not being able to tell can be a problem. The good news is that my guest today can help us. Pamela Meyer is an author, certified fraud examiner, and entrepreneur, described by Reader's Digest as the nation's best-known expert on lying. Meyer is the author of the 2010 book, Lie Spotting, Proven Techniques to Detect Deception. Her 2011 TED Talk, How to Spot a Liar, has exceeded 16 million views and is one of the 20 most popular TED Talks of all times. Ms. Meyer is the CEO of Calibrate, a company which trains financial institutions, insurance providers, law firms, and human resource professionals on verbal and nonverbal cues to deception, facial microexpression and interpretation, advanced interrogation techniques, and information elicitation. Hi, Pamela. Welcome to Intangibles. Hey there. It's great to be here. I'm not lying. <laughs> Being a foremost expert, on the topic of spotting liars, um, you must have drawn some pretty uh, drawn into some pretty strange situations, I would guess. Um, are there any stories that you'd care to kick us off with? Well, I don't think I'll tell anyone else's stories because those are probably private. But I can tell you a story that got me thinking about lying, which is that uh, my business is based in Washington D.C. now, but. Uh, it was in New York for many years, and I was recruiting uh, at the time some social media uh, marketers. And I had put an ad out, and we were in the middle of doing interviews in my office. And one young lady who really had a great resume and looked really promising, was incredibly charismatic, uh, came in, and she walked into the office in a complete huff. Her clothes were a little bit disheveled. She was uh, very nervous. She was hyperventilating. She was also very compelling and interesting. And she just said, you know, I'm so sorry. I, I, my wallet got stolen and I was walking across the park and I ended up, uh, having to pay a taxi driver cause I'm late and I need $5. And would you mind? I'm really, really interested in the job. I'd love if you could just give me $5. So I gave her the $5 
And she went downstairs and paid the taxi. She came back up and she then conducted what was probably the most successful of the interviews that we did. She was very talented. She was smart. She was able to do the job. And as a contractor, we hired her on a part-time basis. Uh, she had great credentials from university. Uh, she even at the time uh, was personally telling us how she was promoting, um, th at the time it was some websites, some websites at her temple. Um, and it was really very impressive. And she was very uh, a, a lot of fun and was helping us in all kinds of ways. About two months into her uh, tenure with us, um, she abruptly quit and she disappeared. And we decided not to pursue it because somebody who's not going to show up for work without really explaining after a few phone calls, we said, we're not going to beg her to come back. Something's wrong. We called her references, no answer. Um, and about three weeks later, her sister contacted me and asked if I would participate, which I declined at the time in an intervention because it turned out that she was a compulsive liar that she had not gone to any of the schools that were on her resume, that she had not been promoting our websites at her temple, and that she probably had not lost her wallet and needed those $5. And it got me thinking about just how easily we can be drawn into a lie when we're in the presence of someone who's really compelling and charismatic. Wow. So, okay, so th th this, this happened to you. Um, this happened to me. Uh, I don't know what's happened to her, but this happened to me. Uh, so, all right, I'm going to, okay, that's exactly the kind of story I was hoping for. And it's fantastic because I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, after I ask you a whole bunch more questions, I'm going to swing around and figure out how you might have been able to spot what was going on um, and put you to the own, put your own test. Let's start. Um, uh, probably we should define what a lie is. Could you define what a lie is for us? Well, you know, we look at lies... Uh, on a spectrum from white lies to really significant lies that punctuate important decisions we might make in our life. And so by pure definition, we can say that we define a lie as, you know, a false statement that has a recipient, you know, the liar must have a real in serious intent to deceive. It can't be an accidental deception. Um, it might in include omission of important information. And it usually requires a context of truth. You know, you're not making up a story and everyone knows you're making up a story. You're actually, you know, intending to tell a true story. That's by definition what a lie is. But I must say that uh, when we look at lies, we really are only concerned about lies that might affect, you know, what we call high stakes lies that might affect like a decision such as who we're going to work for, who we're going to marry, who we're going to date, who we're going to vote for, what car to buy, what house to buy. Those are the lies where it really is going to affect our lives. And we do tell white lies all the time, and I'm less concerned about those. Okay. So uh, what you're saying is that the, you know, we've gotten so good that the truest definition of a lie is only part of the shade of what could be a, 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 much, a much worse, much more elaborate lie, I guess. Exactly. I mean, we're all used to being lied to during the day because we know lies occur. And sometimes they're very practical. I mean, it's not you, it's me. We've all heard that one, right? <laughs> um, someone is not going to say, you know, oh my gosh, um, please don't make me tell you why I'm really breaking up with you. I can't wait for this conversation to just be able. They're not going to say all that. They're just going to say, listen, it's just not it's, it's me. It's not you. Or someone's going to say, you know, you don't look fat in that. That dress looks great. Or, you know, I'll call you or, you know, that kind of stuff that we call those practical lies. You know, they're often to avoid conflict. Yeah. And so, again, we're less concerned about those. Um, we also have sort of bolstering lies where somebody will kind of like try to present themselves a little bit better than they really were. They were a VP when, in fact, they were just a director. Um, you know, they've been doing this job for 20 years when in fact, maybe it was only 17 or 18, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that, that, I mean, that leads right into the question about your, about your motive for lying. Why, so why do we lie, you know, except for the little white lies, which are just to smooth things over and make things simple in general, though, why do we, why do we lie to each other? We lie for lots of different reasons and sometimes it's valid, uh, sometimes we lie to make someone else feel better, to avoid conflict. Sometimes we lie 
for really defensive reasons. We're either avoiding punishment or we want to protect somebody or we want to protect ourselves or we're trying to maintain someone's privacy or we're trying to get out of an awkward situation. We're kind of making a defensive mo- move in, of sorts. We also lie sometimes in, in, in ways that we call offensive. So we might want to gain an advantage over somebody or really create a positive impression or try to control information in some way in a work environment or we may be lying to get ahead so we can get the reward that someone else can't get. So we lie there for offensive or defensive reasons. Mm. Out of curiosity, is one more prevalent than the other that you're aware of? Well, we know that different personality types lie in different ways. So for example, um, extroverts tend to lie more than introverts. Now, this is not always the case because there are certainly many exceptions to the rule. We know powerful people lie more and with kind of more fluidity. We know that men and women lie for very different reasons. So, for example, and of course, these are generalizations, but some of the science really does point to this, that women will lie oftentimes more to protect other people or to avoid conflict. And men, we find, lie more about themselves to kind of present a better image of themselves or to kind of uh, bolster themselves up in some way in the image of others. Hmm. Um, just a quick side story. We, uh, my family Skypes with my mother every uh, Sunday night. And uh, my son, who's nine, uh, plays a game with his grandmother that, to start up the conversation. It's called Two Truths and a Lie. And you have to take, in this particular game, you take um, three, things that you've done over the weekend or the last week since we talked and two of them are true, of course. And then one of them is a lie. And my son who now is nine, um, is a incredibly fluid liar. Um, you know, it's not like tacked onto the tail end. It's not obvious. Like my, 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 my mother, his grandmother can never tell when he's lying anymore. So that, 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 uh, could be a sign that he's an extrovert. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have a ten-year-old daughter. It's the same way. We always say it's an arms race at home, because she knows her mom's really good at detecting lies, so she's gotten really good at lying. <laughs> so we're past the days where she used to think lie spotting meant confessing. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, okay. So, but um, being that it's my son and his grandmother, do I'm going to transition that? Do men and women lie about the same things in general, or or different things? Men will lie more to bolster themselves up. They'll lie more to present themselves in a way that looks better to other people with more concern about the way other people are viewing them. We do find that women will lie more to protect others or to avoid conflict. It's interesting that men men are way more egocentric than and women are much more, uh, you know, outward thinking. Um, I see that in my wife all the time, by the way. Um, So, and the thing that I mentioned in the intro... um, People aren't very good at distinguishing the truth from lies, Um, although (laughs) we think we're better at it than we actually are. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a good thing in a way. We're a trust in in America. We're a very trusting community, you know, and so we, we have what we call a truth bias. So you might remember, you know, George Washington, the story of George Washington could not tell a lie. We know that in America you're innocent before proving guilty. These things are good for democracy. This truth bias is not very good for spotting lies. We're not that great at it. So that's one of the reasons. The other is that we tend to rely much too much on instinct when, in fact, there's a bunch of science that can inform how to look at somebody more accurately. Right. So uh, kind of again back to this intro. Okay. We talked about the little white lies that are just maybe to protect someone's feelings. But the truth of the matter is that the the big lies, the lies that you're talking about, the big honking lies, they're actually really costly for the country and the economy. Isn't that isn't that so? Yeah, I mean, we have a serious, serious issue, particularly with fraud right now. And the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners just came out with their 2018 report to the nations. Um, uh, the last report showed almost a trillion dollars of uh, fraud, nine hundred and ninety four billion dollars a year. But I think the numbers are even higher now. It's worth taking a look at that, and I'm happy to send you a link if you want to put that onto your website. But it's a very, very significant issue. Your lies really can destroy lives. They can destroy businesses. There's an economic impact to it. And 
trust is really what glues us together and can be significantly helpful to us when we're in a business situation and everything from transaction costs to research and development to hiring to legal can be reduced. All those costs can be reduced with the right amount of trust aimed toward the right people. So, and, and people lie to, well, on their resumes, you, you told, told that story, they lie to insurers, they lie to, uh, they commit fraud in the workplace. I mean, and it's, it's Yeah, I mean, it's one common. of the best studies, I think Career Builder did the study where um, they looked at maybe, I think, fourteen to 16,000 resumes, and they found that people lie all the time on their resumes, which is not a surprise. But what I found funny about it is that one of the most common lies was pretending to be a member of the Kennedy family. I mean, people will really come up with the most incredible things on their resumes. And so we know we know that people lie to insurers. We know they lie on their resumes. We know that people are aware of fraud in the workplace. But because they have fear of retribution, they will not report it, which is why hotlines are showing us that that's one of the best ways to get tips. If people have an opportunity to report fraud or to report an inside threat, for example, someone who may want to exfiltrate data, sell it to the competition, harm your IP, all of that is much more likely to emerge to a C-suite executive through a hotline uh, than it is necessarily through just personally interviewing people. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, so I would, all right, it probably goes without saying then that, you know, we've set up this premise that people can't effectively spot lies. And if you can't, you're probably at a huge disadvantage. Um, okay, but there's hope. Um, I read that 80% of communication is nonverbal. 65% is body language. 15% is pheromones. So if in my mind, that means we can literally learn to spot a liar if we watch them carefully. Is that correct? Yes and no. Okay. And so, yes, it's very, very important to be able to spot a liar and understand the cues. But if you think about it, that's not that useful. You also have to know how to get to the truth. So if you sense that someone's lying, don't stop there and certainly don't accuse them wrongly. Like check your sources, go back, interview other people, make sure you understand what the truth might be because oftentimes someone's lying for a good reason. Perfect. Yes. Um, yeah. N knowing something is incorrect doesn't necessarily help you make a better decision until you exactly. until you, until you find out what it, what it actually is the correct thing. Okay. Um, let's talk about some of the tools that liars use. This is this is uh, you know when I was doing the research with this, the, to me this was the re I thought really interesting part. Um, so maybe you could give us some examples of different things. Uh, the first one that I I noted and I wrote down was something called a parrot statement. So let's set up the premise. I assume the premise is that two people are talking and someone starts to use like tactics, liars tactics. And one, and one of them is a parent, sta parrot, parrot statement, right? What, let's talk about that. Yeah. So when you're, when you're trying to figure out if someone's lying, you want to get a sense of their norm, first of all, kind of what's their baseline? How are you? How was your weekend? Did you go shopping? How are the kids? You're trying to get a sense of what's normal because it's really if someone veers from their norm. Like if someone's all stressed out, it doesn't mean anything, particularly if they're a stressed person. If they're normally very calm and you probe them with a question and it stresses them, then that's significant because they've left their baseline. Mm. I mean, that said, we look at kind of verbal and nonverbal indicators of deceit. And what we find is it's only the first few seconds after a hard question is asked that's considered scientifically reliable. So if you ask somebody a question that's hard and they repeat the same question back at you, which is what we call a parrot statement, they're really stalling for time. So if, if you say to someone, you know, where, where were you on, on the 7th when that car was stolen out of the parking lot? And they say, huh, where was I? Instead of answering the question, they're stalling. That's a parrot statement. Yeah, everything is about this this couple of moments in your mind where the liar's trying to get his or her story straight, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, when the cognitive load is really high on your system and you're trying to think what to say, act composed, appear spontaneous, that's when you're going to leak these verbal and nonverbal indicators of deceit. So when you're interrogating someone or interviewing somebody, what you're really doing is very artfully, subtly raising the cognitive load with a set of questions that allows you to maintain rapport with them, but at the same time, get them a little bit uncomfortable, should they be lying. So when you ask somebody to tell their story backwards, for example, 
that raises the cognitive load significantly and you might see those indicators of deceit. If you start to ask them some harder questions, again, the cognitive load will be hard and high on them. They're going to be thinking, what should I say? So they're going to, they're maybe going to parrot back what you ask them. They might try to reason with you in some way and say, well, wait a minute, if I was in the parking lot and that car was stolen, why does my friend say we were in a meeting? You know, that's kind of a, they're just reasoning with you. Or they may protest the statement altogether and say, hold on, that's a ridiculous question to ask me. We call that questioning the question. Uh, or they may make you try to make you feel really guilty and act like really offended by your question. Uh, or they may just use bolstering or bolstering language. You know, you know, to tell you the truth, as far as I can tell, qualifying language, you're not going to believe this. They might be overly verbose. When someone's telling the truth, they just will calmly answer your questions. And they'll also give you the attitude that they're on your side, that they want to help you get to the truth. And that subtle shift in attitude is really significant. Right. So, I mean, look, I think you just gave the gist of it there, right? The gist of it is um, one side, the truth, the person that's trying to divine the truth um, makes it mentally challenging on the person that's trying to commit the deception. And the person that's trying to commit the deception does all these kind of mental gymnastics in order to either buy time or to align that person. Okay. So you talked about Paris statements. Uh, we didn't talk about dodgeball statements, did we? Well, sometimes somebody will kind of fish to try to figure out what you know. So, for example, they may say to you, um, well, did you have the cameras on in that parking lot that night? And so, you know, they're trying to figure out whether or not you have any information that they need in order to protect themselves, which is why oftentimes an interrogator will bait the person across the table from them and say, if I had the camera on, do you think we would see you in the parking lot? And they're just baiting. They're really just trying to suggest they're creating what one interrogator I know calls a mind virus on the part of the person across the table from them. A mind virus. Yeah. Well, I'll be looking that up. Um, okay. We talked about guilt tip statements, which is uh, something that that you're offending me by doing that. We talked, let's see, protest statements. You mentioned that. Uh, okay. Or overly wordy statements. Um, oh, we didn't talk about uh, the, the invocation of religion. I swear to God on my mother's grave. I just wasn't in the parking lot. Uh, oftentimes we see that associated I, with I, deception. I love that. I love that one. Um, you know, there's, there, there's 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 uh, so much done in the name of religion, isn't there? Um, let's see, distancing statements. That's another tool, also. Oh, did you did you talk about that? Keeping yourself out uh, of the answer yeah, I mean, by name. In my TED talk, I talk about that. I put up Bill Clinton, where he said, "You know, I did not have sex with that woman, yes. Miss Lewinsky." So oftentimes, somebody will distance themselves unconsciously from their subject. And so you want to pay attention to language. And if you're in the financial world, oftentimes we actually go back and we look, for example, at earnings calls. And you can actually see in the language when you go back and you do what's called statement analysis, where a CEO or a CFO, when they were defending something that may have gone wrong with a company's financials, they're actually using distancing language. Uh, so you, you, you might you might look at that. You also want to look at what we call kind of soft replacement language, euphemisms. So, you know, the rapist isn't going to say, I raped her. You know, they're going to say, I didn't touch her. You know, the embezzler isn't going to say, you know, I stole the money. They're going to say, I didn't take the money. So when someone starts to use soft replacement language, we saw this with Lance Armstrong a lot when he was defending his use of, uh, you know, his, do his doping. He, he would say, you know, it wasn't much and it was just some materials. He wouldn't actually refer to the drugs themselves. And so those are euphemisms. Uh, he just settled, I think, uh, the other day for f 15 million bucks or something ridiculous. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Have one, I have a question about um, verbal leaks or tics. And that's, you know, you, you can explain what that is to us. But my wife asserts that um, that doesn't necessarily mean people are lying. It, if you listen to me, it's just, <laughs> I, I do it all the time. And it's just, me trying to buy time while I'm thinking about what I want to say doesn't mean it's a lie. I'm with your wife on this one. Um, so you just heard me say, um, yeah, 
we punctuate our language all the time with little verbal leaks and ticks. It doesn't mean anything. What's significant is if someone really shifts from their norm. So if you're going to ask them a hard question and they've been in the middle of this incredibly fluent conversation with you, and by the way, you're not interviewing them on the press and this is not a legal interrogation where they're really parsing out their language carefully and you're just having a conversation. It doesn't mean anything if they do ums and ahs. If you ask them the hard question and then they pause for 10 seconds, that's significant. Or they do the ums and the ahs for a much longer period of time than they normal do, normally do, then that's significant. But punctuating your language here and there with statements or with ums and ahs really doesn't mean anything. And so it tends to be quite quite common. Is it this? And this it's the same with um, what's called frequency of disfluency. Um, that means likes, you knows, size. Is is it, is it the same thing, or are those actually different? Well, you know, to tell you the truth, in all honesty, that kind of qualifying language, yeah, oftentimes is associated with deception. But again, you have to be careful because what we look for when we're interviewing somebody is two or three of these indicators on the verbal side, two or three of these indicators on the nonverbal side. And then we go in and we ask a lot harder questions Mm -hmm. and we will confirm with facts and we'll go back and do our research. And so it's very, very important that you don't point the finger and say, ha ha, you said, you, you said, um, (laughs) you said, Jesus Christ, you said you're lying. (laughs) And that's not the way it works. You really have to put all of your information together and start to see the full picture of the person across the table from you. There isn't that much magic in it. It takes a lot of a lot of background research as well. So what you're saying is that doesn't mean yes, it means keep looking. Absolutely. Okay. That's exactly right. When you see red flags, that means you're gonna funnel down and ask harder questions. Right. Um back to the uh Lance Armstrong, Bill Clinton. Replacing I with you. So liars will unconsciously distance themselves. Same thing. That's the distance. And they oftentimes, they oftentimes will replace the pronoun I with you. The other thing that they'll do, and we see this often, is they'll shift the tense. So, for example, uh, you might remember Scott Peterson. I don't know if you remember Scott Peterson, who was accused – of his wife disappeared and he was accused of being involved in her disappearance and kept saying he was innocent. There's a huge media frenzy around it. He actually talked about her in the past tense when he described her, but she was supposed to be alive. She was found dead. And so that was a big key, you know, clue to investigators that maybe he was involved because he unconsciously used the past tense on someone who was dead while he was in the process of saying he was frantically looking for her. Yeah, we he, saw this as well, Susan Smith case. Yeah, they they knew something that not everyone else did yet. <laughs> right. So we call that inappropriate tense. But if you go back and again, you this is not something you would do on the fly. But if you look at someone's statements once in a while, you will see the inappropriate tense used because unconsciously they are living out the events as they actually occurred, as opposed to how they are presenting them to you. Right. And that's against that. Again, that's the cognitive overload. They just can't keep it all straight in their head, what they're supposed to be saying. Um, that's exactly right. Right. Um, okay. Let's switch to um, facial expressions for a moment. Um, we talked to, uh, actually, I think it was just the last episode that we got that got put out, or maybe two ago. Um, we spoke to a poker professional about tells. And we also uh, talked to a behavioral psychologist um, about charisma. And they indicated that there's a lot of information that you can gain by paying really close attention to a person's face when they're um, speaking to you. Um, So I'm going to touch on a couple and, you know, you can kind of like we did with the uh, verbal tells, you can, you can explain to us, yeah, this is real. It's not really real. This is important. This is what you should do. This is what you should look at. That might be helpful. Um, So a lot of this is around these um, micro expressions. Let's talk about that for a little bit. So uh, oftentimes somebody will make one facial expression while another one kind of leaks through in a flash. And that's what a micro expression is. It's really the unconscious expression of a particular emotion. And again, you know, 
so Paul Ekman, who is one of the great researchers on this, um, identified seven emotions, anger, contempt, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, and surprise. And he said, you know what, all of these can be viewed on the face if you actually know what to look for, if you can look carefully at the eyebrows and the way the face and the smile can be um, asymmetrical in certain places and so forth. And he identified what the expressions look like and came up with a system for how to, to view them. I went through training on this as well. And one of the big one of the things that we found is that, of course, the face is a messy thing. I mean, anger is usually confused with disgust. Contempt can easily be confused with a kind of happy expression. Disgust can sometimes be confused with anger. Fear can oftentimes be confused with surprise. And so we have to be careful because it's a muddy world. We usually feel and show many emotions at once, but there is a way to find a couple of expressions that are associated with deception that are important to know about. For example, most expressions are completely symmetrical when they're in their true authentic form, with the exception of contempt, which is kind of an asymmetrical sneer. You know, when someone sneers, it's kind of the lip corner is pulled up and in on one side of the mouth. When you have that contempt, um, it, it is associated with deception. Oftentimes doesn't mean someone's necessarily lying, but you could be in the middle of a relationship that's a little bit toxic. I, I will tell you that I'm in deep trouble on this because um, it is possible that I'm part Vulcan and um, <laughs> my my mouth cannot say yes, uh, have some when my my mind is saying no, thank you. Don't want any. Um, I just can't get away with it. Um, that's a great thing. That's a great thing. Um. Yeah, to I don't want know. to be. I, I mean, know. because when you have that discordance between the body, the language, and the face, and there isn't that kind of symmetry, people really do pick up on you as being inauthentic. And so to have that desire to be authentic and to not be able to show, you know, to show an expression that contradicts what's going on in the situation is really, a, it's a lovely quality. It's a great thing. Don't lose that. Uh, I don't know. I think, I think I've, um, Missed the opportunity to take advantage of certain situations based on that. But um, if you say that it's good, then I'm going to stay with it. Um, all right. So I'm a uh, squelch expression. Um, the reliable muscle patterns, you started to touch on that. Um, for example, smiling. When you smile, it makes crow's feet around your eyes, right? But, but a fake smile and a real smile, you could tell the difference. Yeah. So, I mean, it's great. You really have studied this material. I'm really impressed with your ability to understand it so deeply. And, and you're exactly right. So the face, oftentimes we will look at a smile and we'll think, oh, they're happy. They like that meal. They like this conversation. They want to do business with me. But a real smile is not in the cheeks. The real smile is in the crow's feet around the eyes. So you have to be careful again, because we call duping delight, where the kind of unconscious smile at getting away with a whopper can oftentimes be associated with deception. So you need to know kind of what's a normal muscle pattern for the face and what's associated with different emotions in order to interpret them accurately. That's back to the baseline that you were talking about earlier, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about blink rate? Is that a real thing? If people blink a lot? Blink rate is really complicated. Uh, there's controversial science on this. Some science says that blink rate is increasing when you're being deceptive, and some say the cognitive load is so high that you still the blink rate. And so as much as we know right now is that if there's a shift from your baseline, there may be deception or there may be at least an increase in load associated with it, but we're not 100% sure. Right. So there's a couple also, there's a couple of things with regard to expressions that have to do with your physiology. Uh, one of them is pupil dilation. And I assume, and this gets back to when they used to do lie detector tests, which I guess are not even valid, but your your body does certain things internally that you just can't stop, right? Is So is pupil dilation a sign of uh, of a lie, potentially? So pu pu it can be very much. It's a sign of cognitive load being high. And we know that Oftentimes, when we're in the process of a lie, one of the things we cannot control is the dilation of our pupils. I sit on the board, the advisory board of a company called Converis, which 
has several ocular measurements. It's a lie detection company that has technology that is really upending the polygraph and is more reliable and inexpensive and scalable and it's being used by governments and institutions all over the world. And this technology really focuses on singularly ocular measurements, among other things. And so we know, for example, that pupil dilation can be associated with deception. It's one of many, many ocular measurements that the technology is now leapfrogging our human ability to detect. And it's very, very interesting to look at that in terms of kind of what the future of lie detection is going to look like, because it will probably be this kind of combination of the human across the table looking at micro expressions and squelched expressions and reliable muscle patterns and blink rate and pop pupil dilation. But at the same time, we will have technology that's able to look more deeply at those than we can as a human. Okay. Um, so I make, I, I'm telling a lie and I make an expression and I've done a pretty good job of making it seem authentic, but I hold my expression for like 10 seconds long. That's not good, right? Yeah, that's really weird, right? It's kind of it's kind <laughs> of weird. You know instinctively when someone's doing that, when they like when someone fakes that they're mad, you probably know this with your kids when you know you're going to take dessert away from them or something like that. And they kind of fake an anger, they kind of fake that long extended expression of anger. We do that in the business world all the time as well. We kind of fake our expressions. They really don't tend to uh last on the face as long as we might use them to kind of signify a particular message to the person across the table to from us. So these so are, five seconds, five seconds is probably the, 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 the maximum somebody would make an expression at most. It's usually much faster than that. Yeah, it's right. Yeah. I, I mentally moved on in a second or two. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, okay. So we've got, all right, now we've got our verbal. Now we've got our facial expressions um, we know some things that liars do. Um, let's talk about how we, um, kind of evolve our suspicion that we're being lied to. Um, what, 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 you know, we, you know, we've got the first couple of red flags. How do we confirm that in fact we're being lied to? I think you started to touch on a couple of these things. This is really important because, as I said before, it's really important that you don't get it wrong and it's not a parlor trick and you need to really make sure before you accuse anybody that you've got your ducks in order. And so as we discussed earlier, you always want to baseline someone first to get a sense of their norm. You want to ask them very open-ended questions. Don't put them on the defensive. Don't. It's not law and order. Where were you on the day of? It never works. So you want to be very artful, ask them open-ended questions, keep rapport with them, look for those clusters of deceit, whether or not it's on the verbal or the nonverbal side. And then you really need to kind of figure out if there are any gaps between their story and what really could have happened, any gaps between behavioral and emotional consistency, figure out where, where the gaps are, and then you're going to confirm the facts. You know, you need to ask a bunch of confirming questions, and there are lots of ways you can do that. You can say to them, for example, what should happen to whoever stole that car out of the parking lot? Well, if someone's telling the truth, they're going to say, you're kidding? Call the police. Fire them. Get them out of the, get them out of here. Get the car back. If someone is lying, they're going to say, oh, I don't know. They're going to recommend lenient punishment, maybe parole. I'm not, it's not really my job to say. I'm not on the committee that decides that. They'll equivocate. So oftentimes there are questions you can ask like that that will surface whether or not somebody may or may not be telling the truth. You mentioned something really quickly, um, which I thought was important, and I, so I want to go back and touch on it. Something You said something about studying the clusters. Yeah, so when we study the clusters, we're looking for these verbal and nonverbal indicators of deceit. You're looking for two or three on the verbal side and two or three on the nonverbal side. So whether or not it's a bolstering statement or a qualifying statement or kind of a non-spontaneous response time, or someone's giving you an inappropriate amount of detail. If you have a teenager, I'm sure you know, that's very common. Um, or the story kind of lacks appropriateness or is too long in the prologue, if it just feels off verbally, and you're seeing clusters on the nonverbal side, that duping delight, 
the unconscious smile at getting away with a whopper. You might see contempt. You may see a shift in someone's blink rate. You may see someone kind of moving objects around a table, kind of trying to create a protective barrier between you and them, um, or they may be slumped. Those are, those are clusters. And what we always say is, if you can't remember all that, because everyone's really busy, and particularly the people that are listening to your podcast have big businesses to run or funds to manage, just ask yourself subtly, did that person shift into what we call convince mode? Uh, did they somehow shift from all of a sudden offering you information to kind of trying to protect themselves in some way and convince you? Do they go from being cooperative to having to persuade you in some way? And when you see that, that can be an indicator of deceit. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was kind of that the everything has to hang together, right? The, mem- the mannerisms have to hang with the facial expressions, have to hang with the word. Like the, if, if something is out of the ordinary with, with regard to how that all fits together, then that might be a, an indication. That's exactly right. You're looking for confluence between the words, the facial expression, the story, the facts, and your basic, uh, basic knowledge of what you think went down. Okay, so now I've got my now I've got my tactics. Um, but you started out the discussion with that story of the woman who is a compulsive liar, and so now I've got all. I feel like I've got all my tools in my toolbox. I assume that you've kind of gone back and looked at that story and said, oh, this is what I should have detected. This is what I should have known. If you have, it'd be great to circle back and put all this into, into, into practice. Well, it's interesting. You know, when we're conned, oftentimes the art of it is that the person across the table from you who is the con man or woman is promising you something you really want. And so you have to really know yourself well. Bef- this is really where it starts. Self-deception really starts with your own blind spots. I needed somebody like yesterday when she walked in the room. We were behind. We hadn't found anybody we needed. We'd been interviewing. We were tired. This woman walked in. We were like, oh, she's it. And so we really needed it. We really wanted it. And so oftentimes they will promise you something that you want in the moment. And you have to be careful about not wanting that thing too badly. So that's the first piece. I, sh- I should have figured that out to begin with. And second of all, she just, it made no sense. I mean, you know, people, people don't uh, run across parks for interviews typically in New York City. You know, they may take public transportation or they may uh, take a taxi or an Uber, but they don't, you know, start jogging across a park with their, with their wallet. And it, it, it you know, the, the logic of the story didn't make sense. And of course she did have all of the, I'm sure the, the, indicators had I bothered enough to ask a few questions like, well, and I could have asked her question back, asked her story backwards. If I really thought she was lying, I could have said, well, um, when do you remember first having your wallet and what did you do before you left for, um, for this interview? And what, you know, what event did you have before that? And I could have asked her to kind of walk back her story and I probably would have seen many more of those indicators of deceit had I done that, but I wasn't trained at the time. I think the most interesting part is that you were, you're kind of saying that you're a little bit complicit um, in that you were, you're willing to be lied to. And maybe she sensed that. Yeah, we participate in the lie all the time. I mean, a lie doesn't have any power just because someone tells it to you. You know, a lie gets power because you kind of agree with the person across from you mm. that you're going to be deceived. And so this is where it all starts. It starts with self-deception. It starts with knowing yourself and what your own blind spots are. And then you really have to, when you're across the table from someone having a conversation, trying to figure out if they're being uh, truthful and if they can't be trusted, you need to be somewhat analytic and you need to come in prepared. You need to know your questions ahead of time. You need to know your facts ahead of time. So you're not caught on the fly being taken in by the emotion of the situation. Good to know. So um, podcast listeners will know that near the end here, there's three final questions that I always ask. And so I'm telling you, you're near the end. We're in the final three. Um, For the first question is, is there anything about spotting liars that I didn't bring into the conversation that I probably should have because it's important or it's significant to the arc um, that you'd like to talk about? Yes, I think we really need to be careful that, you know, we don't want to create a culture of running around saying liar, liar, pants on fire. And 
you will find that what's interesting about asking someone a whole lot of questions when they tell you your when they tell you their story if you keep your curiosity hat on if you just stay curious don't judge them don't look down your nose at them as if you're morally superior in any way because of course that breaks rapport but also there's no reason for that if you just keep curious and you ask a lot of questions because you want to get to the kernels of truth underneath life gets really interesting hmm. it's really not just about the lie it's about the truth underlying it and oftentimes the person you think is the worst liar in the world will have one of the most fascinating stories that you never would have gotten to if you were just pointing the finger at them so all right so i'll keep that in mind um besides the what i thought was a very thorough um book discussion on this topic um other materials or resources that you would point people to um, you know, to educate them, inform them, improve their skill set, any of the above? Um, well, you can watch my TED Talk if you don't want to read the book, and in 15 minutes you can learn a whole lot. Um, there's a lot of funny stuff out there. So, for example, um, Alibi Network, where people could sign in and ha have alibis automatically um, published for them, and it, it's kind of funny and odd. And, uh, you know, it it... What I would say is that for anybody that's interested in truth and lies, to focus less on the material that's out there on how to spot them and more to start thinking about where they're going to find the people that they want to trust. And so look around and pare down your group of friends. You don't need that many LinkedIn connections. You don't need that many friends on Facebook. And really just – Find a small group of people that you feel you can work with and go to war with. And if you focus on the people around you and less on just the instructions and books and websites, you're probably going to find quite a bit of rich material. So a message of positivity. That's good. I, I got to tell you, this this uh, alibi network thing kind of blew my mind. So for anybody who doesn't know what that is, if you really want to tell an elaborate lie, go check out Alibi Network. I don't know if it's still up. They're, they were trying to take it down. So it may or may not be up. Uh, wow. Um, I haven't looked, but you, yeah. can, you yeah. can check. I think I, I may have checked a month ago. It seemed like it was up a month okay. ago. Um, okay. Uh, where can people find you or follow you? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter at Pamela Meyer. Uh, my business is called Calibrate. And uh, there's a blog called Lie Spotting as well, liespotting.com, uh, where we post quizzes and uh, blog posts on different uh, aspects of truth and lies. Yeah. The, that website is um, C-A-L-I-B-R-A-T-E dash Inc dot com, Calibrate Inc dot com. So you should check that out. And I thought the uh, TED Talk is also great. Uh, guess what, Pamela? That's it. Thanks very much. You've been especially great. so much fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was, um, I, I mean, it's a fascinating topic and I appreciate your thoughts and your research and your time on this. I uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. This has been Intangibles. I'd like to thank Denton's Venture Technology Group at dentonsventurebeyond.com for being the sponsor this season and a supportive partner. Operating as a boutique within the world's largest law firm, the Venture Technology Group runs with hard-charging tech entrepreneurs to drive growth through strategic business, finance, and legal advice from Silicon Valley in New York to London, Berlin, Hong Kong, and beyond. Learn more at dentonsventurebeyond.com. I'd like to thank VC Careers for their support. And I'd also like to thank Ben Glaue, who's a fantastic sound engineer. It is a privilege to work with him. Find him on Twitter. His handle is at visible underscore sound. And thank you. Keep an eye out for the next episode. I'm your host, Steve Burr.